This is a relationship that breaks every rule in the book. Some of the most dangerous predators on our planet, accepting a human into their midst. Ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. It has taken Kevin Richardson years of patience and dedication to build these unique bonds. But keeping predators in captivity is fraught with difficulty. A lion is in need of an urgent operation. A hyena cub learns to stand on all four feet the hard way. My poor little boy. There's devastating news in one of the lion prides. There's no evidence to suggest a fighter. And Kevin faces a race against time to save the animals and where they live. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. This is the kingdom of the White Lion, a 700-hectare private wildlife sanctuary run by Kevin Richardson. It's home to some of Africa's most dangerous and rarest predators, lions, hyenas, and two black leopards. Eight prides live here, and in the Big Kings, the largest pride of all, there's a lion that needs an urgent operation. Hello, Rafiki. Come lie down here, my boy. Come lie down here. Five-year-old Rafiki has spent his life with an ungainly saunter, and it's getting worse. He has an extra dew claw on both of his hind legs that shouldn't be there. They are a deformity and need to be amputated. Vet Jonathan Fish has been called out to remove them. I think you've seen it before. The dew claws. Yeah, but his ones are not as integral. They're not as attached. They, they're kind of like just hanging on by a thread of skin. Yeah. And when he walks around, it just flops around, you know. Dew claws are normally only found on the front legs of a lion, not the back. They act like thumbs and are used to hunt and hold down prey while lions eat. But Kevin is worried Rafiki's redundant dew claws could be accidentally torn off with the risk of serious infection. And by removing them, he hopes it will help the ungainly lion to walk properly. Before the operation, Rafiki needs to be anesthetized. So I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, entice him with some pieces of meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rafiki, Rafiki, Rafiki. They use a pole syringe to inject him with the sedative. Yeah. Willie, I'm going to just time it. Leave you alone. Okay, okay. Leave him alone. Let's go, let's go. Anesthetizing a lion is risky. The dose is difficult to judge. Too much, and his heart could stop. Too little, and he could wake up early. Yeah, it's quite a hard dose. Yeah, he's going down like a ton of bricks. He's okay? Yeah. One, two, three, cut. Once he's safely sedated, Jonathan needs to work quickly. Right, so I'm going to cut through the skin first. Oh. There's some major blood vessels under there. No, there's a big blood vessel that supplies the skin. Yeah. And... There's a big one that supplies the claw itself. I mean, if you can imagine having that attached to your leg yeah. and walking around with that, it must be highly irritating. No special technique there, you just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Sure, look at 
They check to make sure Rafiki's not showing any signs of the anesthetic wearing off. If he wakes up early, he could attack them. They remove the second claw and stitch the wound. Um, the problem with the lions are they all, their tongues are very, very rough and they pull stitches off quite easily. To avoid this, Jonathan uses internal stitches that he hopes will keep the wound closed while it heals. What a difference, eh? Look at that. There you go. You look like a normal lion, my boy. You're going to be so thankful. With the operation over, Rafiki is left to recover. Just get him comfortable. Yeah. They now need to make sure the wounds don't reopen and become infected. A few hours after the operation, and with Rafiki just about on all four feet again, he's released back into the big king's pride. Probably got a huge headache. So Rafiki's just come out, and he's actually just trying to find some peace and quiet. <laughs> he's gone to a spot in the shade, and the youngsters keep pestering him. All the adults couldn't really be bothered. They've understood what's going on, I think. They've said, OK, leave him alone. He looks a bit grumpy, but not the youngsters. They are curious about these bandages and the smell of these bandages, and they keep on harassing him. And he, he's getting up and, and giving them a good beating and then going back down. Kevin originally helped to set up the kingdom in 2005 for the production of a fictional movie following the story of a white lion. The retired stars of the film now live out their days here, alongside some of Kevin's favorite lions from his former job at another lion park. The feeding of the animals, vets' bills, and general maintenance cost up to $20,000 a month, all paid for by a private investor. But now the funding is running low, and Kevin needs to find a way for the park to become self-sufficient. If he can't, all the animals could be sold. I've made a promise to them, I made a commitment to them. So at the first hurdle, I'm not gonna waver and just throw in the towel, it's far too easy. For Kevin, finding a way for the kingdom to contribute to the conservation of lions is crucial. One day he hopes to open it to the public and give educational tours. It's the day after Big King Rafiki's operation, and Kevin heads over to check up on him. The cubs have tried their best to pull off Rafiki's bandages, but with no luck. There we go. There we go. Now, you can have some now they do need to be removed. Kevin has two choices. Put the lion through another risky anesthetic. It's all flop on each other. Or chance taking the bandages off himself. Kevin's insight into the pride dynamics is crucial in judging the right time. Pick the wrong moment and he will be at the mercy of over 210 kilograms of angry lion. He's in a much better mood. He's recovered quite well. And he's a lot less grumpy than he was yesterday. Eh? And I think, well, he's in a great mood. I'm going to try and take his bandages off. If I can cut through the whole length of it, he'll be able to pull it off himself. really cool things about having a relationship with a lion is that if there's anything that you need to look at or inspect it's quite easy to do it without having to put them under. I can look at a little wound I can say okay well that doesn't really need any treatment. I can try and get the bandages off his paw don't have to re-knock uh, him out again. 
Hey, flicking. It's I'm really irritated with you. Okay. Got it. With Rafiki on the road to recovery, no one is prepared for the shocking events about to unfold in another lion pride. The next morning brings heartbreaking news. Lion cub Vietzi is alone and distressed in his enclosure. There's been a tragic discovery. The dead body of Vietzi's best friend, Mufumu. Vietzi, who grew up with Mufumu, is now desperately craving attention. For the last five weeks, the two cubs had lived in a pride with three older lions, Tristan, Zippo, and Nash, following their successful introduction. Um, yeah, when I got here, all the lions were around Mufumu's body. And uh, what was quite disturbing is when I got there is that um, his um, the stomach area had been opened up. So it looked like they had been feeding on him. Yesterday, he seemed fine. Um, just before I went, I went home. So he wasn't, he definitely wasn't sick. Baez is a little bit scared, but um, I've just phoned Kevin as well to let him know what has happened and uh, he's uh, on his way here. The discovery is a shock. Rodney fears the three older lions may have attacked and killed Cub Mufumu. For Vietzi's safety, they've been separated and put in another enclosure. As soon as Kevin arrives, it's vital they determine how Mufumu died and whether the older lions were responsible. After hearing the terrible news of Cub Mufumu's death, Kevin has rushed to the kingdom. He wants to know if there are any clues that may reveal if the cub was killed by the older lions, Tristan, Zippo, and Nash. Although Mufumu and Vietzi had lived apparently happily with the pride for over a month, introducing new lions always carries a risk. Even if it's done as carefully as possible, violent attacks can still happen. There's no evidence to suggest a fighter. If he was in a fight, anyway, they're going to kill this guy in the neck immediately, a, a mm. suffocating bite. Mm. Mm. While the others rip him apart. Mm. If you look here, there's absolutely no puncture wounds. No, there's nothing. Nothing in the neck. On his back legs, where they normally bite them, nothing. When lions attack, they claw and bite their prey from behind, pulling it to the ground. A suffocating bite then closes the victim's airways. On the neck, on the face, look at his face. Yeah. His face is perfect. There's not even a mark on his face. And the other thing that's not adding up is that, you know, when, you, when I got the call, I, I immediately had thought of Ayeti. Immediately mm. thought this is Vietzi's being killed. Mm. If it was to, an altercation with them, because this guy was more confident, he was more sociable. Vietzi was a little bit more skittish and, and, and a little bit more terrified, you know. And they mm. obviously hone in on that kind of, wow. you know. You know, what I'm thinking. Mm. Tongue does look a bit swollen. I'm thinking Pafeda. Tongue swells up, you can't breathe. The puff adder is a highly venomous snake. One bite on the throat could be enough to asphyxiate a young lion. And that's what Kevin believes happened to Mufumu. Don't even know what to say. I think what we need to do is maybe today just bury the body. No. It's likely that once Mufumu died, 
the older lions began to investigate the carcass and tear it open. The truth be known is that it does happen. Uh, it happens in the wild and it does happen in captivity too. But if an animal does die, sometimes, you know, they, they do tuck into it and they do start to consume it. And sometimes once their carcass opens up, a kind of like feeding instinct and frenzy takes over. Later that day, Mufumu is laid to rest in one of the kingdom's most peaceful areas. Okay, slowly. Kevin is now faced with a dilemma what to do about the remaining cub, Vietzi. As a precaution, for now, he'll have to live on his own. We can kind of give him the attention that he kind of requires at, at, at the age that he is now, but ultimately, he's gonna grow up alone. So we need to seriously think about what to do next. And I don't have the answers at the moment. I'm just trying to get over What's, what's going on and what, what, how to deal with the circumstances. After seeing his fellow pride mates feeding on Mufumu's body, Vietzi is now timid and scared. Come here, my boy. Kevin doesn't want to risk putting the grieving cub back with the older lions in case he's picked on. You know, I've worked with lions so long and this lion's clearly missing his brother and It'll take some time, like a dozen people, for him to get over it. But he will, he will get over it, he'll move on. Uh, it just means that we're going to spend a lot more time with him and give him a lot more attention, especially during the next couple of weeks, you know, just while he's pining. And you can hear him, it's a melancholy uh, cry, and he's trying to call. He, he doesn't understand, you know, what's, what's kind of going on. Shamba, you're feeling lonely. Eh? What happened here? But in the long run, Kevin knows human company alone just isn't going to be enough. Let's go for a walk. Tristan, Zippo, and Nash, removed after Mafumu's death, are now being taken to meet the three other members of their former pride. They're going to be reintroduced to Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby, the other half of the so-called terrible teens. For the last five weeks, the two groups have been living apart. But they quickly recognize each other. When Mufumu died, obviously that's uh, created a bit of a problem. And what we've decided to do is let this group rejoin, reunite. So the six um, have got back together. That was very peaceful. Maybe that's because you all know each other now, eh? Hey? That's a good group of lions, man. That's what I'm... This is the last yeah. empty enclosure. But now the terrible teen's pride is moving in full time. We certainly have a space predicament now at the kingdom because we don't have one free area um, to put lions in. This is a bit of a problem because every time I want to rotate animals around, it means we've got to take a group of animals and, and, and put them somewhere else in like a makeshift area. So it's not the ideal situation. With the reformation of the pride, the kingdom has reached capacity and there's no money to build new enclosures. Finding ways to fund the kingdom has forced Kevin to look outside the park and outside his comfort zone. So today I'm doing a motivational talk just talking about the lions and talking about what I do. I must say, I'm feeling very, very nervous, but I think it's, hopefully it's gonna go well. I um, don't know what to expect because I've never done one of these before. Getting off the point, this chap is fascinating and we reckon if we all put our resources together, we might yet save this planet. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Kevin Richardson. Despite the alien environment, this is an avenue Kevin can ill afford to ignore. We, I start with them when they're really young. The will to learn is really what it's about. 
Businesses are willing to pay a premium to see him talk about his life with lions. None of the animals that I interact with are truly wild, as in the you know, definition of going to the Kruger Park or into Botswana. You know, this picture did the rounds all over the world, people saying, this is this crazy ranger from South Africa, and he found, came across this pride of lions, and he you know, made a really special bond. He just whispered to them. <laughs> so when I read this, I was quite, I was quite amused. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, and I was a bit worried. I thought, oh, geez, what's going on there? People are thinking these things which aren't true, really, about me. With this first public talk under his belt, Kevin is hoping that there will be more lucrative bookings in the pipeline. Back at the kingdom, Cub Vietzi is still grieving for his best friend, Mufumu. <laughs> With the lion's welfare at stake, Kevin decides there's only one solution. He's hoping that his former employers at a nearby lion park may have a cub of a similar age that he could pair with Vietzi. One of our lions is in desperate need of a, a, partner. a partner. Yeah, and sure he's, he's a bit lonely. Yeah. I'm 99.9% sure we can help you out. Cool. Is it, I mean, obviously... You're welcome to it. If it's yeah. minor, so that's really good news. Um, the lion park does have some uh, females of the age that we require. So it looks like Vayetzi is going to get a partner. And this is excellent news because he's pine been pining over the last couple of days. He's really, every time you walk past the enclosure, he's calling and calling. The next day, Kevin heads off to the park near Johannesburg. Yeah, good. Good, good, good. Whoop. They're going to meet several hand-raised lion cubs under a year old. <laughs> Kevin and Rodney feel confident that the cubs are still young enough to start building a relationship with them, and crucially, with Vietzi. Hello, my sweetheart. Hey, are you coming to a new home? Are you coming to meet Vietzi? They're looking for a female, likely to be more submissive around the traumatized male cub. You're quite a feisty bunch. Yeah, we're going to have to instill some discipline. There is one perfect year-old lioness. But she has a sister, and the park doesn't want them separated. It's an extra mouth to feed, but the two show they might just have what it takes to win over Vietzi. I think this is absolute perfect age for Vietzi, because they're slightly smaller than him, slightly younger. There's two of them. He needs a bit of confidence boosting, so he's going to feel a lot more relaxed interacting with smaller lions than he. Having spent their entire young lives at the lion park, the lionesses are not accustomed to being loaded into a van. Come on! Oh! Finally, with the help of a few tasty treats, they're on their way to the kingdom. But the big test is yet to come. Will Vietzi accept them? After the traumatic death of his best friend Mufumu, Vietzi is about to meet two unfamiliar lionesses. The newcomers, Livy and Ginny, are nervous. Come on. It's their first time being introduced to a strange lion, and they're wary of Vietzi. And without his best friend Mufumu to back him up, Vietzi is also reluctant to make the first move. Slowly, not me. Kevin decides to step in as mediator. The funny thing is that Vietti is really and truly using me as a human shield. Every time he comes to interact with these girls, funny enough, I'm in the middle, hey? What I'm going to do is I think the lions must get to know each other and he must gain some confidence on his own. I'm going to just uh, slowly separate myself out of here and let them uh, mingle. And it's up to him to impress the ladies now. Yo! Because it's time for you to be a man, my son. Kevin patiently waits until everyone relaxes. 
This is the kingdom kind of lines, eh? All love. This is all about love, my boy. The kingdom full of love. Here we go. But replacing the bond that Vietzi had with Mufumu is not going to happen immediately. <coughs> the next few days are key. Over in the nursery, the young hyenas are also about to meet a new friend. Abandoned animals born at the kingdom are brought here to be socialized. Four-week-old cub Max was hand-raised after a deadly power struggle between the females in his clan ended in his siblings being killed. Hello, <laughs> my boy. Max has been bottle-fed for the last month, and now Kevin and Rodney are introducing him to the other youngsters. Look here. It's important he learns to mix with other hyenas while he's still young. What's that? If he doesn't, he risks never being able to live in a clan. Listen, you guys, you better behave. Behave yourselves. Today is the very first time that he'll be let free with the other excited cubs. Grab me here, give you a hot advantage. It's a tense moment. Let's take it out the way. Even young hyenas can be highly aggressive when sorting out their hierarchy. Okay, oh. slowly, 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 slowly. It's just excitement, and they're all just trying to tell him, "Hey, this is this is me. I'm I'm uh, Woody." I'm the boss here, <laughs> and then they're all taking turns and saying, I'm Benza, and, I'm the re and they're trying to get in his box. Max is a, a male, and in this group we have predominantly females. Um, so there might be a little bit of neck biting and ooh, we're the dominant females, but I think it's going to go very well. I think Max will be quite fine. It's all very new for you, boy. This is part of the socialization process and we'll be doing this on an almost daily basis with Max. Every day just give him a little bit more time with the hyenas. He can, uh, he can spend uh, the days here and then ultimately uh, the night. There we go. The there future go. for Max and other animals depends on Kevin financing the kingdom. To generate income, he plans to open it to the public. But first, he needs to find the investment to build suitable facilities. To help raise money, he recently set up a local volunteer program where people pay to help out at the park. For me, it's, um, it's a way of getting involved and, and, and trying to make a difference. In, in, I think we live in a beautiful country and I think um, this is just my way of, of getting involved. I think everybody has to pick what you're passionate about and this um, is mine. So um, yeah, I lo I'm looking forward to working here for a long time. Kevin's wife, Mandy, is visiting the kingdom along with their son, Tyler. With the local volunteer program proving a success, there are now plans to expand it internationally. Taking paying guests from overseas could provide a significant income. But first, they need to work out a program worth paying for. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Hello. Hello. Did you enjoy your drive? I've just been thinking now in terms of the work, I was thinking like um, anti-poaching, so going out and looking for traps and things, um, river cleanups on the riverside, um, bush cutting, fire breaks, fence maintenance or in terms of checking, fixing, and then possibly that idea we were thinking about the camera traps and yeah. setting up the camera traps just to see what actual wildlife is naturally occurring here, but just to get some records and, and see what actually is going on out there. Um, you know, I've been discussing with, with Rodney about putting collars on uh, some of the jackal that occur naturally, the leopard, the brown hyena, and seeing their movements and seeing their whereabouts. Mm. And, so together with the camera traps, um, fantastic. I mean, we've got a natural uh, diversity and wildlife in this area that also needs conserving. It's two weeks since Kevin introduced White Lion Thor 
to lionesses Kusasa and Sabindi. He decided that Thor, having spent his life as a bachelor, needed some company of his own kind. Lions are the only truly sociable cat. But it seems Thor is the exception. Although the three have settled down peacefully enough, they continue to keep their distance. As one of the leading stars of the White Lion movie, Thor stole the limelight. Now the bachelor is seemingly too shy to make the first move on his new lady friends. What's going on with you and those girls, eh? Don't you like those girls? Why can't you just be with them like this, eh? Be nice to them. Kusasa and Sabindi have been with Thor for around about two, two and a half weeks now. And it really hasn't gone as I expected. I expected a little bit of friction in the beginning. And then um, two and a half weeks later, I expected this happy pride lying under a tree. It's, it's kind of weird because the females have settled nicely in the enclosure. And there's almost this easy indifference. They're quite happy to live side by side, but they don't come close to each other. I'm glad I've tried it because, you know, if we didn't try it, we would never know. And we would always be wondering. So each to their own, you know, animals are all different. And when you think what's good for one is not necessarily good for another. After spending years building a close bond with white lion Thor, Kevin is going to test their relationship following the introduction of the two new lionesses. He's been waiting to pick the right time, and with all peaceful in the newly formed pride, he comes to a decision. A lot of people must be thinking, well, how do you know for sure that when you go in there, he's not going to just you know, jump on you and take you out? Um, and it's kind of like when you know somebody over a period of time, you will understand um, when they're in a bad mood or a good mood, not by speaking to them, but just by looking at them. And those are the, the messages that uh, Thor will send me. Um, I've, I haven't noticed any of that of late, so I'm going to take it one step at a time and see how it goes. His instinct proves right. With everyone relaxed, Thor shows he still has a place in his new pride for Kevin. And in another pride, there's one more success story. Following the traumatic loss of his best friend Mafumu, Vietzi has spent the last few weeks getting to know lionesses Ginny and Livy. I don't mind nice spots. Much to Kevin's relief, Vietzi is no longer pining for his old friend. I've been attacked. I've been mauled. Having seen how his, his happiness has changed over the last couple of weeks, he's completely a relaxed, happy lion again. And they, they get along very, very well. They all lie together. They're always licking each other. Livy, which is the paler one, is a little bit more shy, a little bit more reserved. Um, and does take a lot of her cues from her sister, who's a little bit more, uh, she's darker, uh, old Ginny, and uh, a little bit more adventurous. She was actually the first one to uh, bond with Fayetzi. It's not bad now. Oh! Once again, it's Kevin's turn to establish his place in another new pride. Forging new relationships now is key to being able to interact with these lions when they're older. No. Even though these two girls have been hand raised, they're not used to people sitting and lying down with them. So when they see me on the ground, they see it as an opportunity to jump on my back or stalk me or go around or bite my top, which is not a behavior or a trait that I want to, you know, reward or enforce. Why is it whenever I wear a fluffy top, you want to eat me? The three lions put Kevin through his paces. Stop it. It's vital for Kevin to weed out behaviors like this now. What may be playful to another lion is far more dangerous to a human. Stop it! What they don't realize is that I'm just a human 
And I've got very thin skin. I'm not like Vietzi where they can actually bite him physically quite hard. So every time they bite me, I'm trying to show them that I don't like that. Don't bite me hard. Ay, ay, ay. Don't bite hard. No. So things like lying down, uh, teaching them not to unsheath their claws, all that kind of stuff has got to be installed now. How do I do it? Just come in here, spend time with them. When they exhibit a trait that I don't like, I discipline them. Generally when it's in play and we're just sitting around and I'm tickling her and then she tries to bite me hard, just give her a gentle no. Hey, no. Her ears go back, she gets the message. And it's the most amazing, they learn very quickly. Those girls are naughty. And in fact, they're a lot more abusive than I am. Um, I've seen lions this age in a pride get a hell of a smack from, from the old man because they're really getting on his nerves. Don't chew me. Don't sneak up behind me. Now she's realizing that it's not about biting Kevin's hand off. Uh, she could have a good gnaw on it. If she bites me too hard, she'll get a little bit of a, a warning on her nose. But there we go. That's the behavior I like. And it seems Vietzi is not immune to Ginny and Livy's influence. The girl's oh feisty behavior is rubbing off. Stop that now. I'm going to work a little bit harder at trying to build relationships with these two and also trying to stop their naughty behaviors from creeping in. Because this guy's got very naughty in the last couple of weeks. Yes, you know you have. You have. You're a naughty lion. From the other side of the kingdom, there's alarming news. A bushfire has broken out and is being fanned by high winds. Without road access, it would take hours for the fire service to reach them. It's up to Kevin and his staff to try and contain it. There's two things. I mean, it could burn the whole farm down, then the animals have got nothing to eat. And also, it can trap animals unnecessarily. Thank goodness it's far away from the lion store. But I've seen the wind turn, eh? When the wind starts to pump, there's nothing stopping this fire. So we, we need to get this fire out now. Come on. Bush fires are a fact of life in South Africa. But they can have devastating consequences, destroying vast swathes of land and anything in their path. A few hours later, the worst is over. It looks like we got it under control. It looks like we put it out. The only problem is, is I've seen this situation many times before. And when we all just go back and relax and talk about the incident, it flares back up again because the wind picks up. The wind's died down a bit. So um, at the moment, we're looking good. But what we'll do is we'll just keep some boys around here with the beaters, just in case we have a little flare up, put it under control again. With one crisis narrowly averted, Kevin heads back to the other side of the kingdom. Come, Maxie! Come, 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 quickly! Quickly! Max, the hyena cub's big day, has finally arrived. After surviving against all odds, he's now ready to join the nursery full time. But Max's enthusiasm to join the new clan is exciting the others. Before Kevin has a chance to take him into the enclosure, Max suddenly makes a run for it, disappearing behind the nursery's fence. Did he bite him? Badly. Oh, f Rod, off. Okay, come, bring, bring him here. Max's inquisitiveness ends in bloodshed. 
First aid kit. In his excitement to join the others in the nursery, newcomer hyena cub Max pushed his ear through the fence. One of the older dominant cubs retaliated and bit him hard. Maxie went around the back of the fence and so he got a little bit of a, a nick out of his ear and it's bleeding a bit, but you'll live, my boy. You're, it's a big day for you. Shame, man. Look at that. You brave little fella. Looked worse than it was, huh? Mm. So it's not atypical for a hyena adult to react to a young hyena like Max. Max was excited, you know, running around the pens and everyone's, you know, excitement was just a little bit too high. Um, and he managed to, you know, grab him through the fence. We're going to put you in with those terror. Now there you go again, you see? There you go again. A little bit more cautiously this time. <laughs> Uh, they, you know, hyenas are so tough. A little wound like that, that would probably send a human being baby to hospital for a couple of days. With Max recovered, Kevin takes him into the nursery. In no time at all, the cub forgets about his sore ear and starts to befriend the new clan. But the biggest test is still in store. At the end of every day, all the nursery residents are safely shut away in a night shelter. If Max manages to spend the night unscathed, he will be on his way to establishing his status in the clan. The following morning, it's a big moment as they wait to find out. This morning we came and you're always a little bit apprehensive, but uh, when Rod let them out, they all sprung out of the nursery, uh, no bite marks, all just one uh, cohesive unit. So I think it's, it's really well done on all fronts, you know, from the, from the fact that Max actually survived. Um, he was just so tiny and we were so lucky to actually intervene when we did, because I guarantee you if we didn't, he would be dead. And there's more good news. The first bookings for the International Volunteer Program are in. It means there is another way to help secure the future of the park. Kevin can now turn his attention to his long-term goal, finding a way to open the kingdom to the public. A facility like the kingdom is really important in educating people about the plot of the lion in the wild. And you know, from my perspective, let's face it, if I'd never saw a lion in the zoo when I was a child, I probably would never have had a connection later on. Um, so that's hopefully what a facility like the Kingdom can do. It can make one little guy change his life, and he wants to grow up and be a conservation officer. Then we've done our, we've done our job. At home, Mandy also hopes their hard work is finally paying off. I think it would be a long time dream for us to finally have the kingdom open and running and, and yes, hopefully when Tyler gets big maybe take it on and carry on with it as a family business. Um, certainly it's something we've been passionate about for long enough and it's not something we're going to give up on in a hurry. So I do hope it will be going in the long term. Where are you going? <laughs> So the, the last six to eight months at the Kingdom have been really hard, it's been tough times, but things have turned around, things have looked up. Um, we've really applied our minds to how we can make the place a success and it's slowly turning. In the future, I think uh, we're all feeling a lot more optimistic. However, it's still, it's still tough times, so yeah, we've just got to continue forward.
This is a relationship that breaks every rule in the book. Some of the most dangerous predators on our planet, accepting a human into their pride. Ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. It has taken Kevin Richardson years of patience and dedication to build this unique bond. Come, 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 come. There it's go. But keeping predators in captivity is fraught with difficulty. An angry lion needs help. A hyena cub is saved from certain death. Maybe come up with and when lions meet, they clash. All while Kevin tries to keep his dream alive. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. On the banks of the Crocodile River lies Kevin Richardson's 700 hectare private predator sanctuary. Home to lions, hyenas, and leopards. Known as the Kingdom of the White Lion, the park was established in 2005 for the making of a feature film. Now the movie is finished, there's no reason for the kingdom to exist. Unless Kevin can find another method to make it pay its way, the park and the animals will be sold. Kevin has dedicated the last 12 years to the lives and well-being of these animals. With their close bond, many are like his best friends. For him, turning his back on them is not an option. With a park that's running at capacity, it's vital that the animals share enclosures. But there is one lion that throws a wrench in the works. The star of the feature film, Thor, seems to have the usual trademarks associated with a movie star. Cravings for attention, the constant desire to look the part, and the diva-like tantrums. Well, Thor is a very temperamental line. <laughs> In fact, uh, sometimes even I find it a little bit tricky to read his mood. He can be the happiest, most friendly line, and then like that, he can also be a lion that will want to uh, attack you over a rock that he wants to take possession over. Now, all lions, as we know, love their food. However, Thor <laughs> wants to kill you even before you've given him the food. So Thor can be quite a tricky cat. There's a tragic sting to his tail. Lions are the only truly social cats, but after two years working on the movie, there was never a suitable cat that Thor could live with. Kevin worries for Thor's happiness and spends much of his time stepping in as a feline friend. So one of the few lions that actually really enjoys me to stick my finger right in his ear canal. <laughs> and I'm not bulldusting you when I tell you my finger's almost tickling his brain. When lions are in a group, they would groom each other and they lick their, each other's ears. So kind of like I use this brush, they would use their tongues and in they go. Now Thor obviously is not with anyone, so I've got to spend extra time just loving and grooming and bonding, and, and that's why I brush him. To provide Thor with stimulation, Kevin takes him for walks in the wild bush area surrounding the lion enclosures. It's home to, among others, giraffes, wildebeest, and impala. Finding a suitable partner hasn't been easy, but Kevin's had a breakthrough. We finally found some suitors for Thor. Uh, two lionesses, Kasasa and Sabindi. He doesn't know it yet, but in a couple of days' time, he's going to be introduced to the lovely, tawny females. Hey? We've decided that they would uh, suit Thor just fine. We're going to put them on the pole. Um, because we really don't want to be breeding any more lions over here at the kingdom, eh? But you'll still get the company. It'll be nice. 
on the other side of the kingdom in the hyena clan, there's trouble. Mother matriarch Gina has been fighting for dominance with her daughter Oslo. Their power struggle ended in murder as they cannibalized each other's cubs. There's just one survivor, and Kevin has had to take drastic action. This is the only surviving little cub, and I've had to remove him now because out of five cubs, we've now landed up with nothing. I think we're going to have to take you and hand raise you, my little guy. The responsibilities that come with taking a youngster away are tremendous because now you are basically becoming its mother. So you immediately start thinking about the future. Where is he going to go uh, once we've raised him to a level where he doesn't need to stay with us 24-7? A hyena is usually thought of as a vicious scavenger, and it's uncommon for them to be bred in captivity. It's even more rare for them to be hand-raised. <laughs> Here we go, my boy. You don't want to stop for a burp then, boy? Hmm? <laughs> You're a greedy guts, so that's why you eat too quickly. You eat too quickly, my boy. I can feel all that air. Your stomach's hard, man. You need to get rid of that air. Okay, okay. And you like a milkshake. Hmm? Unable to defecate by themselves, a hyena mother would stimulate bowel movement in her cubs. But without mother around, it's up to Kevin to lend a helping hand. They don't have the, uh, the bowel movement or the ability to push it out um, on their own. So it'll come, it'll come in another week or two. And you can feel nice thoughts to push. Once the, oh, here he come. Oh, I can smell it. Not my favorite job, but one does get used to it. So after little Max, I think we're going to call him Max, <laughs> has had a good feed and relieved himself, um, it's a perfect time and opportunity to introduce uh, him to the dogs. Come, let's go and play. Cubs require constant socialization to prepare them for life back in the animal world. Over the years, Kevin has found help at hand on his own doorstep. You've seen, uh, Valentino has seen many, many animals come through the house. So, he's generally very good. <laughs> he's been... Valley, stop it today. Slowly, boy. That's how you call him back. Because that little high pitch is, uh, that's something that we found over the years they respond to. They make those sounds. With an additional animal to occupy Kevin's time, there's another weight bearing on his shoulders. He needs fifteen to twenty thousand dollars each month just to break even. And without the facilities to welcome the paying public, it's becoming impossible for the kingdom to survive. At the moment our roads are not good enough and our facility, the, the safety of the facility in, in terms of bringing kids around is not safe. It's not, it's not up to spec. So we'd have to spend a fair amount of money on that. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of like a vicious circle. It's like we need to spend money to make money. Kevin is depending on some of the profits from the movie, which helped establish the kingdom, to enable it to have a chance at a sustainable future. The coming weeks will be crucial, as Kevin waits to discover if the film's release will be able to help prevent the closure of his park. The recent brutal battle between mother and daughter in the hyena enclosure resulted in the death of cubs. To restore peace, Kevin has decided to send the feuding daughter, Oslo, and her brother, Barung, to a new home. At the break of dawn, park veterinarian Claire Speedy prepares to dart them, ready for their move to a private zoo in Southeast Asia. 
I'll try and get her side on for you. I mean, so you can get her, her backside. Nice one. For Kevin and Vet Claire, the priority now is to find Oslo. As Oslo's legs give way, Burun looks on nervously in the background. Just moments later, he too is stung by Claire's anesthetic dart. Okay, this is Oslo, and Oslo is obviously Gina's daughter. And she's the one that's been fighting with Gina a lot, although it's calmed down quite a bit lately. But uh, needless to say, it's going to flare up again. And the same goes for Baran. Baran is going to start breeding with his mother, basically, in a, another year or so. As they begin to look for Baran, it becomes apparent he's nowhere to be found. It's vital they quickly find the sedated animal. Unconscious, he could be in danger. Uh -uh. Let's check down here yeah, about the den. Let's do this, do this top part first. I think we've covered this area. Yeah. I've just looked right in that middle there. Claire asked me to look after the baron and I lost track of him and now we can't find him. And he's gone down. It's not good to have an animal that's drug just running around. Well, not running around, as the case may be. Found it! Ah, there's no way he was here when I came last. There's no way he was here. I came right past you. Okay, two, three. Okay. A few hours later, Oslo and Barun are on their way to the airport, the start of a long journey. You know, you never like to see your animals go, but it's, a, it's the reality, you know, if the, if the numbers are getting too great and the complications with mother and daughter and mother and son, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a necessary thing we have to do and, uh, it, it does, you know, people say it gets easier, it doesn't. Um, at the moment they calm, the ears are just going, what's that, what's that? So, I, I must say, uh, this is for me one of the worst parts about seeing these animals go, is just seeing what they have to go through to get to the new destination. But they seem calm, which is the main thing. As Oslo and Barun leave for their new home, Kevin is eager to get back to the kingdom to find out if peace has been restored in the hyena clan. <laughs> the following day, Kevin visits the hyena enclosure to check on the mood. Now the troublemaker has left the clan. you terrible thing. It's disgusting. Out you get. Out you get. <laughs> this clan has calmed down so significantly since Baran and Oslo have left to their new home uh, almost overnight. It was like the old days. So there's definitely something there with Oslo and especially Gina. Um, you know that whole challenging for the throne so to speak. The kingdom's nursery acts as a shelter for any of its abandoned animals. It's currently home to two lion cubs and five hyenas. Rodney Nambakana, Kevin's right-hand man, has gone there to collect orphan males Mafumu and Vietsi. The cubs have grown up together and share a bond like brothers. They've now outgrown the nursery and it's vital they join a pride of their own. Kevin and Rodney have a new pride of six young lions in mind. However, following an attempt to introduce Mafumu and Vietsi to the three rowdier members of this group, 
complications arose. The Cubs were met with hostility. Kevin and Rodney have decided to reintroduce them to the unruly members individually in the hope that this will prevent bullying. They start with leader, Bandit. Ooh, this should be interesting. Oh. Mafumu places a reassuring paw on his friend and takes charge. Be nice, Bandit. All get along nicely. Again, Mafumu dares to approach Bandit. <laughs> Guys in to help, you see that? Slowly. Nicely, nicely. You see? No, 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 no. Tisha? I don't think he really wants to get into a ferocious fight. He's already got a nick on his lip from one of the little guys. So his posturing is, look how big I, I, look how big I am. I'm a big bandit, and I'll, you know, I'll put you in your place. And these guys are like, oh, he is back. Don't pick on us. And as soon as he makes a big noise, they roll on their backs, which is the submissive behavior. I think we're going to have to just leave it for a while and let them all settle, just the three of them, before we start releasing more individuals into this group because it can become complicated very quickly. Let's, let's, uh, let's hope it works out, because if this doesn't work out, I don't know what I'm going to do. Kevin Richardson is not just passionate about his own lions, but is also involved in a conservation project to preserve wild predators. As a qualified pilot, he's received a request to help the sponsoring organization and heads 805 kilometers north to Botswana. Deep in the Okavango Delta lies the research camp for the Botswana Predator Conservation Trust. Set up to study the interaction between all the species of large predators in northern Botswana, it's coordinated by Andrew Stein. These things are living creatures and they have a place in this world and we need to understand uh, what they do, where they go, so that we can conserve them and make sure that life continues. Andrew has had difficulty finding the main pride. They're hoping to locate them from the air. I've seen some vultures down here. Okay. So maybe let's, let's see what we can see. Now, there's definitely something down there. Eh? Um, the vultures are all landing in that tree. Okay. And in front of the tree, I'm not sure what it is, but it, I, could, I could have sworn it looked like a giraffe carcass. I'm going to just do one more uh, circle around there. Okay. And see, see what, you know, maybe, maybe we're in luck. Eh? Maybe these lions have, have uh, made a kill. No, for sure, definitely. There's, I can actually see, I can actually see a line on the carcass. There's definitely a giraffe kill there, dude. All right, great. Let's, uh, I'm gonna, let's just mark that. Let's get in there on the ground and have a look. Armed with their radio equipment and coordinates of the kill, they head into the bush to find the pride. As the sun reaches its midday peak, they finally catch their first glance of predator activity. Well, there's a carcass down there. It's quite old, eh? It's <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I can see him from here. <laughs> Having tracked the male, they cautiously move in closer to try and catch sight of other pride members.
what are the dynamics of this pride? This is the largest pride that we're tracking. So right. there's six adult females. Um, there are nine sub-adults and then five cubs that are a year or less. And then the two uh, pride males. So it's one of the largest. Kevin tries to prevent his own lions from breeding, but the story in the wild is vastly different. Numbers are plummeting, and it's estimated there's been an 80% drop in less than 30 years. Although Kevin has a close bond with his own hand-raised lions, it would be a death wish to attempt physical contact with any others. Thanks to Kevin's help, Andrew was able to rediscover his main pride and keep his conservation efforts on track. Early the next day, Kevin returns to South Africa. But there is a dark cloud looming over the kingdom. Everyone's been relying on the success of the feature film to save the day. The pressure of these expectations weighs heavily on Kevin as he awaits news of the film's commercial success. Cinema revenues are looking meager, and the financial situation is about to take a turn for the worse. Um, the movie's been pirated, along with a whole bunch of other South African releases that have been on circuit. And it's just so irritating. I mean, you work for so many years to put out, put something out there, and then some, I don't even have the word for it, uh, comes along and just cribs it and puts it on the street for, you know, a fraction of the price. Uh, the consequences are far-reaching. Uh, and it goes as far as the kingdom, because if, if the movie did well on, you know, combined theatrical, DVD, TV, we, you know, the, the, the situation would look a lot brighter here. Pressure is mounting, and unless Kevin can find a way of raising much-needed cash, the future of the kingdom's residents looks bleak. If, if the film, you know, for whatever reason now doesn't get out there, um, the consequences are that the park might have to shut down and we might be having to find homes for 37 lions, 20 odd hyena and the rest of the, you know, the animals that live here. There is no easy solution. Um, lions will only be bought up where there's a demand and then at the moment I don't think there's much demand for lions. So quite frankly I think unless, you know, somebody really came in here and bought them out, uh, putting them down would be, you know, a, a real option. Sisters Kusasa and Sabindi's move to join Thor, the lonesome bachelor lion, is imminent. The vets have arrived to tranquilize the lionesses and administer long-term birth control. It doesn't take long for the drugs to take effect. And then they're fitted with a contraceptive implant. The device inserted behind their shoulder blades will ensure that they're unable to conceive for up to three years. The vets have another pressing procedure to carry out. Some of the lions have suffered from a mysterious outbreak of wart-like growths, which they're in the process of diagnosing. One of those affected is Kusasa. Secure in Thor's pen, the vets move quickly to remove the growth before she comes round. So Thor is clearly not happy, and it's because there's a lot changing in his life. He's moved enclosures, uh, now these two lions that he can see and smell in, the, in his in enclosure, and we are all here, really irritating him. It's a delicate procedure. A wrong incision could sever a nerve ending. The removed growth will be sent to the laboratory for analysis in the hope of determining the cause. Okay, cool. 
As the lionesses sleep off the drugs, Thor still seems disturbed by their presence. In less than 24 hours, they will be joining this angry cat. Meanwhile, Kevin and his wife Mandy think they've found a new plan to keep the park from closing. We've had a lot of inquiries into people who just wanted to come out and help on the farm. So we thought, why not, you know? Um, let's get the volunteers through here. They can contribute in a, in a positive way. And it can also help, um, you know, fund some of the things that we need to do here, you know? With a new baby in the family, Mandy in particular is looking at future ways for the park to support itself. It's not just about the income that international guys will pay to come through to us, it's about the, the working hands that we have on the farm. Um, there are other things we are exploring to do with corporates and things like that at a later stage, but um, you know, every little bit counts towards running a big park like we have. At Thor's enclosure, the bachelor is about to meet the two lionesses for the first time. Kevin takes no risks before releasing Kusasa and Sabindi. Thor's still very aggressive. So I've had to bring the, the dart gun out and um, mix up some drugs for um, Thor, just in case I have to dart him um, to prevent him really tucking into these girls. So if it's uh, getting out of hand and I feel that I might have to intervene, then this is, this is what this is for. Fur is going to fly. I think people need to be aware of that. These are lions. They're not humans. And they have their own way and their own mechanisms of establishing hierarchy. One thing's for sure is Thor has to assert his dominance. And that's what he's going to do. Sure enough, Thor is living up to his temperamental reputation as he eyes up the new arrivals slowly coming round in his night pen. Prepared for the worst, Kevin opens the hatch, allowing the lionesses to run out. But true to his unpredictable ways, Thor seems indifferent to their presence. Despite Kevin's anxieties, the girls don't seem too concerned with their new roommate. As soon as food arrives, it's the perfect opportunity for Thor to show off his dominance. But on this occasion, he's met his match, as Kusasa grabs the lion's share. In the wild, um, this, is, this kind of behavior is what you would expect. If a male lion came across two females in the bush, uh, he's a bachelor male roaming, it's not in his best interest to, you know, engage them immediately, because if he gets injured, that's the end of it. That could be the end of it. You know, from a, a wild perspective, Thor's behaving normal. Establishing a hierarchy will take some time. But in this encounter, the lionesses appear to be dominating. In another enclosure, Kevin faces a dilemma. Brothers Tao and Napoleon have spent their lives together. They're the oldest lions, and the first that Kevin hand-raised. At 12 years old, they're very much senior citizens, but can still keep their cubs in line, and have a way with the ladies. But there's a problem with the mother of the group, dominant female Maddie Tao, who looks to be carrying cubs. With a lack of resources, more cubs could bankrupt the kingdom. She is quite a big eater, <laughs> so she doesn't really watch her diet. But more than that, I've seen that the actual girth of her body is, is a lot wider. So I'm a little bit perplexed, I'm not quite sure whether she is carrying or whether she's just a little bit overweight. We have had it before with Maddie Tao that just when we thought she wasn't pregnant, out popped some cubs.
Maddie Tao has been separated from the pride. Fitting her with a new contraceptive implant is the only option. It will ensure she can't conceive, but also won't damage any existing fetus. Vet Jonathan Fish darts her. She does look quite wide. Um, her back, her girth, when the, when the lines generally fall pregnant, they increase in size from here to here. She's fat. She's fat. Don't call her fat. Shame, Maddie Tao. You're just uh, well fed. Kevin remains convinced she's pregnant. Only time will tell who's right. There's danger at the kingdom of the white lion. The lives of the many other animals in the park's bush area are at constant risk from poachers. Poaching is a huge problem for wildlife parks in South Africa, and the kingdom is not immune. Rodney is on poaching patrol. During a recent search, they found 20 traps, all intending to kill their animals. One side of the park has got fences and one of the side of the park has got uh, the river, which basically makes us very vulnerable to, um, to poachers because they've got um, clean access or easy access through the park, uh, so to speak. And also because the animals, this is where they like to drink. It doesn't take them long to discover a potentially lethal snare. There's a, a game path here, so usually the poachers will like to put the snares where the animals um, walk through and basically the animal without seeing the snare would basically walk through the snare and you can see this here is a snare here at this at this height would probably get caught in the in the neck and uh, the more the animal pulls away the snare closes and just suffocates it today they remove just one snare but the risk of poachers is an ever-present threat in the park. Back in the teenage lion enclosure, there's an animal that appears to be out of place. Spunnies has grown up with the lions and is a fully-fledged member of Bandit's Pride. As the kingdom's pretend lion, he's never met a fellow hyena. Kevin and Rodney have decided as the least threatening member of Bandit's troop, Spunny should be the next in the pride to be introduced to Mafumu and Vietzi. Despite Spunny's familiarity with lions, as soon as Mafumu and Vietzi arrive, he's being chased around the enclosure. But help is at hand for Spunny's when his old friend Bandit is released for his second encounter with Mafumu and Vietzi. Kevin's hoping it will be a more peaceful affair than last time. The group quickly settle down and form a truce. Kevin and Rodney now feel they can introduce Bandit's highly strung sister, Gabby. With backup in place, Spunny's confidence kicks in. Enraged, Gabby Riles Bandit, and both lay into Mafumu. Stop it. Stop it. I promise I'll warning you. I ta 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 ta. With tensions running high, 
Kevin has taken the controversial decision to intervene to try and settle the fighting lions. Gabby! Gabby! Nice! Nice, Gabby! <laughs> <laughs> With Gabby's vicious temper spurring on Bandit, Kevin and Rodney worry for Mafumu and Vietzi's safety. It's vital for the Cubs' survival that they come up with a plan B. It's an early start at the kingdom. After yesterday's failed introductions, Kevin and Rodney have another card up their sleeves. They're going to let Mafumu and Vietzi first form a coherent group with three of the calmer lions in Bandit's pride. If this works, they will join the rest. We've got the five youngsters versus the three older lions. They stand a much better chance. Be nice. Uh, uh, ita, kutu, 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 kutu. As time goes by, it's getting, the tension's easing, it's getting easier and easier. Mafumo and Vayetu, you'll notice, are side by side, very still, very quiet, very low, uh, and keeping a very watchful eye on what the other three are doing. Um, it's a good sign from them. It's been a successful morning for Mafumu and Vayetu. Kevin and Mandy's work has also paid off. The local volunteers are starting today. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite exciting, but also quite nerve-wracking from my perspective. There comes an added risk of now you've got extra people walking around the park. You don't know where they're sticking their hands. Got big uh, predators in there that uh, can kill you. So there's always that in the back of my mind. You know, you, you, I, th I think 99% of it is pure logic, but you never know. Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah, you Pleasure. too. Pleasure. Hi, I'm Kate. Kate, nice to meet you. Kate. Corin. 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 Hi, Corin. Corin. Hi, Corin. 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 It's an exciting phase to be part of because one day, should the kingdom be this you know, world-class tourist facility, you guys can say, well, you know, I had a part to play. Following their induction, the volunteers are taken on a tour of the park and are eager to see Kevin interact with the animals. So Alex, Kaiser, Siam. Siam's a really fantastic tawny lion. Hello, Kaisy. Are you in a good mood today, boy? Oh. OK, so he looks like he's in a good mood. Kaiser, to give you an example, cowboy, come sign me. Sammy, 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 Sammy. Oh, 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 oh. So lions will do everything in their time. There's no such thing as human time, and if you want to push them, then you've got another thing coming. You've got to just be patient and, you know, just uh, go with the flow. Cowboy, yeah. Cowboy. Hola. Patience is indeed the order of the day. As Kevin's calls fall on deaf ears, he tries his luck with Thor. But again, to everyone's astonishment, he is completely ignored. As a last resort, he steps in with Meg and Amy. <laughs> who, true to form, give him a boisterous greeting. Free labor from local volunteers like these is invaluable. But if the park's going to survive, then Kevin and Mandy will have to come up with more radical plans. Following Lioness Maddie Tao's procedure to have a contraceptive fitted, it's been a waiting game to discover if she is pregnant or, as the vet thought, overweight. So Maddie Tao, <clears throat> it appears that she's a little bit overweight and she's not actually pregnant. Um, again, Gestation-wise, it's been over 120 days, and there's no signs of uh, cubs. So I think it's a little bit of a diet for, for Maddie Tao. 
Orphaned baby hyena Max has survived against all odds. Saved from the hyena den just days after his siblings were killed by their auntie, he's been hand raised by Kevin. It's now time for his first outing to the nursery. There he will meet Mafumu and Vietzi on a break from visiting the older lions and some curious young hyenas. Over there, my little pupa. Look there. Don't be scared of them. They were once like you. They were once like you too. They know what it's like to be the smallest. Miff, 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 miff. Mafumu, the more confident of the two, wastes no time in making a friendly greeting. Hello, yeah, guy. This is going very well. This is going very well. Look at that. You've all been so nice. Hey? You've been nice. You're such a nice group of animals. Got such beautiful mm. natures. Yeah. Slowly. We all get so excited. Yeah. It's so exciting. All Woody's trying to do is exert her dominance. She's the, the oldest female here. So at this stage, she's the most dominant. Uh, Max is a little male, and she's just saying to him, listen, I'm the boss here. So if you come to my, my group, my clan, which involves two lions, I'm still the boss. Just as the youngsters settle down, Mafumu decides to show his affections. Break my back, man. <laughs> okay, get off me, my mama. <laughs> All right. It's enough. Okay, bye. Bye, guys. I think Max has really done well. He's gone in there with the right attitude. Um, if he went in there with this aggressive, cocky attitude, then they would sort him out very quickly. He went in there all submissive and cute and, hey, how can they not like that cute face? Hey, I'm just a youngster, yeah. Yes, I just want to be accepted. <laughs> He's going to do just fine. He's a fantastic little guy. As life at the kingdom appears to settle down, there is about to be some tragic news. Lion Cub Mafumu is dead. They will need to search for clues to solve the mystery of his death. In the meantime, his best friend Vietzi is left alone. Just when you think you've got everything in order, uh, your, whole, your whole world is kind of shattered. As Kevin mourns the death of Mufumu, the threat of losing the rest of his animals and the entire kingdom is about to become more real than ever. <laughs> 